ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here. I want to begin by thanking the Acton Institute, Kishore, um, uh, and all his colleagues for inviting me to Krakow and to participate in this conference. I, I love Krakow. I've uh, been here on a number of occasions. The last occasion, incidentally, I was the guest of the former British ambassador who took me along to the first night of the proms, which uh, you uh, celebrate in true British style. But, that, um, but today, I'm particularly glad to be here because I think this is a very timely conference. We are perhaps emerging from a financial panic, but we are still struggling with economic recession and we may be entering a currency crisis. All these troubles have quickly generated a political panic, and it's vital that we don't let this turn into an intellectual and moral panic. Morality itself requires that we consider all these things rationally and coolly. Uh, as Pascal said, the first principle of morality is thinking clearly. Despite the crises of the last two years, the fundamental economic environment of the post-Cold War world remains a favorable one. It's a world marked by the spread of political democracy and economic free markets, by the reduction of barriers to trade and capital movements, by the entry, above all, into the market of several billion workers from the former third world. These workers have enriched themselves by moving from agriculture to industry and enriched us by providing goods more efficiently and more cheaply. Not millions, but billions of people have been lifted out of poverty by these developments in the short space of 20 years. And even if it were the case that the current financial crisis is an inevitable and even regular result of market capitalism, as George Soros argues, um, then the globalization of our world would still be worthwhile, uh, since it's better to grow prosperous on a rising but fluctuating curve than to remain poor in a respectably stable fashion. In that respect, Poland is a beacon of hope, though it suffered immense deprivation and waste through two brutal dictatorships, it has made an astonishing recovery in the space of two decades. I know that recovery required pain and sacrifice. But it has tra transformed Poland into a free and prosperous society. I think it's right, isn't it, that Poland, almost alone in the advanced world, has not suffered recession since the 2008 uh, financial collapse. That is remarkable. And I want to pay tremendous credit here to Professor Bacerowicz, the father of the Polish economic revival, who spoke earlier. He, his achievement was and is a great one. But let me suggest that two other factors helped. First, the fact that the church protected Polish society from the worst ravages of communism and enabled a genuine Polish community to continue and develop under the carapace of communist power. Poles never quite succumbed to the terrors and corruptions of communism to the degree that the Czechs and Hungarians respectively did, let alone Soviet Russia itself a society so materialistic after communism that in one survey, a majority of Russian schoolgirls said their ambition was to become a hard currency prostitute. I take that figure with a slight pinch of salt because we all know the desire of young people to shock and scandalize their elders, but even so, it's remarkable. Poland was not under the blanket of communism for as long as the Soviet Union. It had a shorter prison sentence, and it's emerged from the experience in much better shape. Which brings me to my second factor, something that Mrs. Thatcher demonstrated in the British context. Societies take a long time to forget their deep skills. Uh, they don't take cultural makeovers easily. There's something really irreducible about the, te the text and texture of a nation. Many of the economic, entrepreneurial, and professional aptitudes the skills, the attitudes that communism seemed to have crushed have revived with surprising speed in both Poland and Britain. I mean, as the last speaker, I thought, demonstrated very uh, fully indeed. Maybe in Poland they never went away, but were nurtured in perverse ways because communism forced people to be inventive in order to survive. I recall Foreign Minister Radek Sikorsky telling me some years ago how in the 70s, he and his family took an annual vacation in Turkey, which they paid for by buying and selling goods along the way, goods that each respective Soviet satellite lacked. Uh, at any rate, the free Poland today is not only free, but distinctively Polish, and for these reasons, vigorous and inventive. Now, let me ask now how we can further encourage 
these entrepreneurial virtues in Poland today and to do so in a way that respects the Christian values that help Poland to resist communism and maintain its civilization. I'm going to take as my text for the sermon this more, some lines from T.S. Eliot's verse play, The Rock, where he describes the character of a post-Christian society and the character, too, of the post-Christian hollow men who inhabit and shape it. He writes, they constantly try to escape from the darkness outside and within by dreaming of systems so perfect that no one will need to be good. Dreaming of systems so perfect that no one will need to be good. Now, since I'm even less of a psychologist than I am a philosopher or a theologian or an economist, I'm not going to discuss the psychological aspects of Eliot's lines. But the idea of systems so perfect that no one will need to be good is obviously a utopian one that anyone who lived through the 20th century will recognize. On a large scale, it produced totalitarian horrors. On a smaller scale today, it provides us with schemes that offer to protect us against fraud, corruption, abuse, and so on by designing a set of incentives that, we, that will ensure we do the right thing, or at least the thing that the, that the designers of the system want us to do. If we design an economy well, goes this illusion, with all the right incentives and the right prohibitions, then people won't need to be good because they will be automatically nudged in the direction, the best direction for the best outcomes for society. Generally, this delusion, for delusion it is, is held on the left and can trace its origins back to the constructive, I, constructivist ideas of some Enlightenment thinkers and the French Revolution. Um, to the minds shaped by Anglo-Scottish Enlightenment thinking, including the Austrian F.A. Hayek, the idea of designing a free system is almost literally absurd since people are so various that they, if they enjoy real freedom, uh, they will behave in ways no designer could predict. I could put the same point slightly differently in the old joke. You can tell the difference between a French fool and an English fool. An English fool is simply a fool, but a French fool is a fool who reasons. Now, but it's not just the left which is attracted by this idea. Some extreme libertarians are also tempted into thinking they can mold self-interest in, self into a kind of governor to direct people to certain ends. Again, however, if people really are free, some of them will choose ends that would never have occurred to the libertarian designer. And those such schemes almost invariably fail. Well, such schemes almost invariably fail, but I think it would be utopian to think that we'll ever be free of them. In societies like Britain, America, and Poland, this delusion of a society in which virtue is replaced by omniscient social engineering is encountered not in the vast old-fashioned ways, um, but, but in smaller but still significant ones. I want to mention two. Uh, they are regulation and what I'm going to call the, the culture in the public sector, particularly the culture of targets and bonuses. <clears throat> 